All right, uh, welcome everyone to the last session of uh, our seminar for this year. The, please note that our seminar will resume in uh, the end of January with a talk by Omeros Papaspiopoulos on the 27th, I think. David, is that correct? Yes. And anyway, today we are uh, very pleased to, uh, to welcome uh, Sarah Wade and Carla Montero Biocomes, both at University of Indabor. Um, who will uh, talk about MCMC, variationist pers Gaussian processes, and pseudo-marginal approaches. The topics that are very interesting to me and uh, I'm sure to all the attendees. So, Sarah, are you the first speaker of the two? Or? Yes, yes. So, Sarah, please, uh, uh, you can start whenever you're ready. Okay, well, first, I just want to say thank you to David and to Nicolas for the invitation and also for putting together these series of talks. Um, it's been a really great initiative with everything going on this year. And, our, and Carla and I are honored to close up this year's series of talks. So today I will be talking about some work, which was part of Carla's PhD thesis. Um, we are hopefully we'll have the archive paper up shortly um, so but at this stage any sorry any um, comments and feedback are greatly appreciated oops so this work is motivated by um, some of our previous work on multi-level non-stationary gps so this is a construction of deep gps where we stack the gps in a way to get non-stationary behavior. So this means that we wanna model functions which might have very smooth regions, have sharp changes and show sharp ch fluctuations in other regions. So first we wanna thank our collaborators on that work. So that's Lassie Wernanen at LUT in Finland, Theo Damalas at Warwick and Mark Girolami in Cambridge. Uh, so here's an outline of our talk. I'll talk about these uh, first three bullet points here. So first I'll just give a very gentle introduction to Gaussian processes. And then I'll talk about an inference scheme proposed by James Hensman and co-authors. And then I'll talk about our proposed uh, pseudo marginal framework. And then Carla will cover the last three bullet points. So she's gonna apply the pseudo marginal scheme to a two level version of those multi-level non-stationary GPs. Um, oops, sorry, I have a new mouse. It's very excited. Um, so let's start with a background on Gaussian processes. Uh, so Gaussian processes are popular both in the statistics and the machine learning community. They're used to construct very powerful non-parametric processes, uh, models. And in spatial statistics, for example, they've been used for quite a long time. Um, they're quite widespread. And here I've just included some uh, standard textbooks in spatial statistics. So you can see how Gaussian processes are used in that field. Uh, in machine learning, Gaussian processes really took off in the 90s and the 2000s. And that was after the seminal work of Radford Neal. So at that time, uh, designing the neural network architecture was um, really an art form. And what Radford Neal and others in that group did was to take a probabilistic Bayesian perspective and they constructed a Gaussian process as an infinitely wide uh, neural network. So partially alleviating that design choice. Uh, so what is the Gaussian process? Loosely speaking, it is an extension of the finite dimensional Gaussian distribution to an infinite dimensional space. So uh, in, in more detail, it's a collection, an infinite collection of random variables. So I'll use this notation here to denote my Gaussian process. So my random variables Z are indexed by X and I'm going to assume that X belongs to RD and each random variable takes values on the real line. And we assume that any finite set of these random variables Z has a Gaussian distribution with consistent parameters. So the parameters include a mean function, 
And the mean function simply represents the, the mean, the expectation of the process at any location. And the covariance function or the kernel function uh, represents the covariance of the process at any two locations. And so typically we use a parametric form for this covariance function, which is parameterized by some finite number of parameters which are contained in phi. So this consistency condition here simply means that our covariance function is a proper covariance function. So it's symmetric and positive definite. And often in practice, we work with what are called centered or zero mean Gaussian processes. So we assume that uh, the mean function is zero at all locations. So in, in Bayesian non-parametrics, so non-parametrics here means we have a non-parametric statistical model. So it's indexed by an infinite dimensional parameter. So for example, we have some unknown function that we want to infer. Uh, Bayesian means that we're gonna place a prior distribution over our unknown parameter. So in this setting, GPs are quite a popular prior choice. So just to illustrate how GPs work here. Um, so suppose I have my unknown function, which is this black line here. And I'm gonna assume that I don't know that black function, but I'm able to evaluate it at some specific locations, which are these black dots here. So before seeing those black dots, I place a Gaussian process prior over my function. So here I'm using that zero mean function. The blue line is my mean function. The gray lines are draws from my Gaussian process prior. And the shaded region represents my uncertainty. Uh, in particular, these are point-wise 95% uh, credible intervals. So now that I've seen these, these points, the function evaluated at these specific points, I can compute my posterior through Bayes rule. And then in blue, we have our posterior mean function. And again, this shaded region represents our uncertainty. So Gaussian processes are a popular prior in Bayesian nonparametrics because they satisfy the three uh, key criteria that we like for priors. So that is, we want them to be interpretable, we want them to have large support, and that we want them to be tractable. So interpretable GPs have those two parameters, the mean function and the covariance function. And we can specify these in a way to encode uh, certain properties of our function or to encode prior beliefs. Large support, so they place prior mass on a large class of functions. And in this case, when we can uh, evaluate the function exactly, our posterior inference is tractable. So we can compute this posterior of the function analytically. Uh, so just a bit more details on that uh, tractability, that last point. So if we are able to observe uh, the function at some locations xn, then the, uh, the, the unknown or our unknown function z is Gaussian, it has a Gaussian process, is a Gaussian process with updated mean and covariance function. Uh, of course, in practice, we don't observe the function exactly, but what we observe are, um, we have some observations y, and we're gonna assume that y is related to our unknown function z through some specified likelihood function. And here we're gonna make the assumption that this likelihood function factorizes across the data points. And rho here are any possible additional parameters of our likelihood function. Um, so for example, we might observe noisy observations of Z. And in this case, rho would be the variance of the, the noise variance. Okay, so GP models are nice, they're flexible, but in practice, there are several challenges of using, using GPs. Uh, the first is a well-known computational complexity. So if we look a bit more carefully at that um, equation that I had for the updated mean function, and this is in the case when I can observe the, the, the function exactly, um, you see that I have this 
covariance matrix here. So this is the covariance an n by n covariance matrix constructed at our n observed locations. And I need to both store and invert that matrix. So inverting that matrix is cubic in my number of data points. The second issue is tractability. So we said we don't actually observe Z in practice. What we have access to is Y. And we lose that tractability of our posterior in most cases. So the only exception is when we have uh, Gaussian observations. And the third crucial aspect is the choice of the kernel and the hyperparameters. Uh, so the choice of the kernel and the hyperparameters determine properties of the function, such as the spatial correlation, the smoothness, the periodicity. And there have been several papers which have showed, so here I've just included one reference here, uh, but they've showed that if we don't uh, specify, if we misspecify these hyperparameters, then that can have uh, severe consequences on our posterior inference. So basically it's important to learn not only the function Z, but also our model parameters and our hyperparameters phi. And we can do that either by using a empirical Bayes approach, so it's selecting the phi, which maximize the marginal likelihood after integrating out the Z, or by using a hierarchical Bayesian, Bayesian approach. So putting another prior, a hyper prior over phi. Uh, the second point is the form of the, the kernel or the covariance function. So often in practice, we use a parametric covariance function, typically that that's, uh, has a stationary assumption. Um, and this is really for computational convenience. So we can use non-parametric forms and Carlo will describe one particular non-parametric form. And this increases flexibility, but it comes at an additional computational cost. Oops. Uh, so to address these issues, um, James Hensman and co-authors developed a novel uh, algorithm which combines variational inference and MCMC. So first to address the computational complexity, they use what is known as the variational inducing point framework. So that allows us to, so I'll describe this a bit more in the next slides, but basically it allows us to reduce the computational complexity from being cubic in M, sorry, in N to being of order N M squared, where we assume that M is much less than N. And there are other approaches you can do to address this computational complexity. So in our previous work, we were, using sparse constructions of the precision matrix, which is the inverse of the covariance matrix. Um, however, that required specific assumptions or requirements on the data and the covariance function. So the nice, uh, the nice point about this variational inducing point framework is that it removes those requirements. Um, then we, then they use uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithms to explore the approximate uh, posterior under this inducing point framework. Um, so as opposed to doing a full variational scheme, this removes any assumptions that we have to make both on the likelihood and um, our approximate posterior. And then lastly, we have those hyperparameters, those kernel hyperparameters and they use a uh, hierarchical Bayesian approach. So they also use MCMC to both get estimates and uncertainty for those hyperparameters. And again, if we were to use a full variational scheme, what we would do is um, an approximate empirical Bayes. So we don't choose the parameters which maximize the marginal likelihood, but we have parameters which maximize a lower bound on the marginal likelihood. 
Okay, so I'm just going to give a few more details on uh, the variational sparse GP framework and then um, some more details on how it's combined with MCMC. So the key idea in variationally sparse GPs is to augment the model with a set of inducing points. So I'm going to use X tilde to denote my inducing points and Z tilde to, to denote my inducing variables, which is my function evaluated at my inducing points. And then we have our augmented prior and from properties of GPs, this is just a multivariate Gaussian. And we're going to write this as a product of the marginal Gaussian prior on Z tilde, our inducing variables, and the conditional Gaussian of Z given Z tilde. Then we have our augmented posterior. This is just likelihood times augmented prior. And of course, if we integrate out the Z tilde, we recover our original model. Uh, so just briefly, what is variational inference? So in variational inference, we have uh, some variational posterior Q, which approximates our posterior pi. And we place some assumptions on Q for tractability. And then under those assumptions, we try to find the Q, which is as close as possible to pi. And so in the variational sparse framework, we're going to make the following assumption on Q. So we assume that it factorizes here where we're going to assume that Z, our function, given our inducing variables, just follows our GP prior predictive. So this is just the Gaussian, our, our prior Gaussian. So this is a crucial assumption that we need for scalability. And then under this assumption, we can minimize the KL, KL divergence to get the form of this second term here. And you can show that the second term has this form. So now we have prior times the exponentiated expected log likelihood, where these expectations again are taken with respect to that GP prior predictive. Oop. Okay, so this is just a simple example to illustrate how variationally, uh, variationally sparse GPs work. So this is that uh, the model, the GP regression model where what I have access to are noisy observations around Z. I'm assuming my errors are Gaussian uh, Gaussian errors, and I know my model parameters. In this case, I can compute my posterior, my low, low dimensional variational posterior in closed form. So it's just a Gaussian distribution. I can also make uh, compute the predictions in closed form. So those also have a Gaussian distribution. And if you look carefully at these equations, you'll see that the only thing I need to invert here, so I don't need to invert an N by N matrix, but what I need to invert is an M by M matrix. So this is the covariance matrix um, constructed at my M inducing locations. And then I also have to do some matrix multiplication. So this term in particular here, so this term cost N M squared, so now I've reduced my computational cost from n cubed down to n m squared. Okay, so now let's just look at some, some pictures to get some more understanding. So this is, again, the black line is that true unknown function. My dots are my noisy observations. The blue line is my uh, mean function, my posterior mean, and the shaded region are my point-wise uh, credible intervals. So this in A, I have my true posterior. B is my sparse approximated posterior with only uh, six inducing points. So you can see that my approximation is not so good here. I'm over smoothing, my uncertainty is too wide. But once I go to 11 inducing points, I have quite a good approximation to my true posterior. 
And with 21 inducing points, it's quite hard visually to detect any differences between A and D. Okay, so as I said before, if I'm gonna do the full variational scheme, I often have to place some additional assumptions on my um, likelihood and also on the uh, low dimensional variational posterior. So in order to avoid those assumptions, Hensman and, and co-authors, they use MCMC to sample from the low dimensional variational posterior. But you see here that we need to be able to compute this expected log likelihood. And this is only available in closed form for Gaussian and Poisson likelihoods. So in, in all other cases, uh, they propose to use quadrature, Gaussian Hermite quadrature to approximate these intractable expectations. So now we have two sources of error in, uh, in our estimates, both from our sparse approximation and from our quadrature approximation. So that the order of our quadrature, which we'll denote by J, needs to be chosen carefully, both to balance accuracy. So if we, if we go back and look, sorry, if we go back and look at this, this equation, so we need to do a quadrature approxima approximation for each data point and for any set of parameter values that we wanna consider. So we wanna choose J so that we have a good approximation in all of these settings. And we wanna balance this accuracy with the computational cost. So in standard settings such as binary classification, evaluating this likelihood, this log likelihood here is just uh, of order one. And I would need to do that for all my data points and for each node in my quadrature. So that would cost N times J. Again, J is the order of the quadrature. But in other settings, so for example, in the model that Carla will talk about, evaluating this log likelihood is of order M squared. So now we need to do M squared for every data point and for every node location. So our uh, computational cost is, uh, is increased in this setting. So our aim is to develop a pseudo marginal scheme that is both asymptotically, that provides both asymptotically exact inference. So that is for the variational, variationally sparse posterior. So we only have asymptotically, we only have one level of approximation due to the sparse assum assumption. And we also wanna reduce this computational cost here. Okay, so we're gonna do that through a pseudo marginal framework. Now pseudo marginal schemes provide a way to do uh, asymptotically exact Bayesian inference when the likelihood is intractable or expensive. And they do that by employing a non-negative unbiased estimator of our likelihood. Okay, so to explain the pseudo-marginal algorithm, let's just quickly review the standard Metropolis-Hastings algorithm. So we use the Metropolis-Hastings algorithm to simulate some values um, data from a target distribution. So for us, our target would be a posterior distribution over some parameters theta. And our key assumption of the Metropolis-Hastings algorithm is that we can evaluate this posterior up to a normalizing constant. And you can clearly see that we need to, we need this unnormalized posterior in our acceptance in order to compute our acceptance probability here. And then the algorithm will return um, some, some values theta, which asymptotically are draws from our posterior of interest. Okay, so now let's move on to the pseudo marginal algorithm. So remember in our variationally sparse framework, our likelihood is both expensive and intractable. 
So what pseudo marginal algorithms do in that framework is to use an unbiased estimator of the likelihood. So here I've highlighted the changes compared to the standard MH algorithm in red. Um, so now for each proposal, theta star, we compute our estimate of our likelihood, which we'll call gamma hat. And now we also need to save or recycle our estimates. And then when we computing our acceptance probability, we simply plug in our estimates in place of the intractable or the expensive likelihood. And the nice thing about this framework is we still have those asymptotic guarantees for these data. So as, as T goes to infinity, these are still gonna be draws from our posterior of interest. So you can see from what I highlighted in red in that algorithm that the, the key ingredient of the pseudo marginal framework is to have an unbiased estimator of the likelihood. And there have been various um, proposals for constructing the estimator in different frameworks. And we need to construct that estimator so that the variance is carefully controlled. So if the variance is too high, we might overestimate the likelihood. And that means that the chain will get stuck at that state. It will be hard to move from that state. So we need to construct our estimator both to carefully balance um, the variance of our estimator with the computational time. And just to highlight, we're in both of these settings. So we have an expensive and an intractable likelihood. So we are going to construct an, an unbiased estimator through a simple extension of the estimator proposed in Kiraz, uh, in a recent paper by Kiraz and co-authors. So we're just gonna add an, an extra level of stochasticity because we not only have an expensive likelihood, but we also have an intractable likelihood. Okay, so remember in the variationally sparse framework, our goal was to find, to, to have the, an estimator of our exp, uh, exponentiated expected log likelihood here. So this is our gamma, this is our expensive intractable term. And in order to build an unbiased estimator of this, our, oops, our first step is to define a difference D. So D is going to be the difference between our expected log likelihood and some control variates. And these control variates are introduced to reduce the variance of our estimator. And in particular, we're gonna construct the control variates uh, through a first order Taylor expansion around the mean. Okay, and then our second step, so we construct an unbiased estimator of that difference D, which we'll call D hat, by both subsampling our data points. So B is going to be the batch size, the size of our subsample, and then also to deal with that intractable part, uh, we're going to sample Z from the variational posterior or the GP prior predictive. So now D hat plus our control variates gives us an unbiased estimator of the log of gamma, but we wanted an unbiased estimator of gamma. So we're going to use the block Poisson estimator in order to get an unbiased estimator of gamma. So I'm not gonna go through the details here, but I'll just give you the the, the definition of our estimator. So this is the definition. It is unbiased. This first term here is just our control variates. And then the second term is the product of kappa Poisson estimators. So we have three key parameters of our estimator. Kappa, which is the number of Poisson estimators. We have B, which is that batch size uh, for our subsampling. 
And then we also have A, which is a lower bound for the difference. And now if we look at this carefully, we see that evaluation of this block Poisson estimator of our likelihood. So the first term con computing the control variates. So this only depends on the mean of, of Z. So that uh, the cost of that is N M plus N M cubed. And then on average, we're going to have kappa difference estimators. Uh, we have, for each of those, we have a batch size of B. And to compute the difference estimator, we need both the mean and the variance. So we have this factor of M squared here. So now we've reduced uh, the cost of evaluation of the likelihood as well. Okay, so we're going to use um, a slight extension of the pseudo marginal scheme that I presented earlier, uh, which is developed in the paper by Kiraz. Uh, so they call it the signed block pseudo marginal scheme. And I'm not gonna go into the details. I'll just give you a quick intuition of what these extra two words mean. So first we have the sign. Um, so remember we had that lower bound A that we needed to define. Uh, so the reason we need that lower bound is in order to get, oops, in order to get a positive estimator gamma, gamma hat. And they show in the paper that it is more efficient to use a soft lower bound. And then in the pseudo marginal scheme, they use the absolute value of gamma hat and apply a sign correction. Um, the second term block. So through the product form of the estimator, oops, the product form of the estimator, they introduce correlation between two subsequent uh, estimators of the likelihood. So they group these Kappa Poisson estimators into G blocks. And each block depends on some random variates. And then at each step of the algorithm, they only update a random uh, uh, one, the random variable variates of one block. And this introduces correlation in the pseudo marginal scheme. So the correlated pseudo marginal schemes have been shown to be much more efficient. And so intuitively you can see that. Again, imagine our pseudo marginal scheme. If we overestimate the likelihood at one state, if at the next state, uh, my likelihood estimate is correlated with the previous one, I'm also more likely to overestimate the likelihood at the next state. So that means that um, this scheme can accommodate noisier likelihood estimates. Sarah? Mm -hmm. Sorry to interrupt, so it's my own question actually. The role of kappa uh, is just uh, if you increase kappa, is if you take the log, you have the sum of a larger number of terms and that reduces the variance. Is that so? Or? Um, yes. So you can, the, the role of kappa to have the kappa different Poisson estimators is simply to, to derive this, this block framework to introduce the correlation. So you could just have um, a single, you could just have kappa equal to, the, to one and then um, have a parameter here, only a single H and have a, the parameter here. So the reason that they use this formulation is to use this block framework to introduce the correlation in the pseudo marginal scheme. Uh, I see, okay, I get it, thank you. Uh, so the variance of this, if you just look at the variance of gamma hat, it's going to be the same as if you used a single Poisson estimator. So the, the advantages are really this, this block framework to introduce the correlation. Um, okay, and then they have some guidelines or some, some algorithms to set those three key parameters. So we had that lower bound, the batch size and kappa. 
And okay, and then here again in red, I've just highlighted the differences of this sign block pseudomarginal scheme compared to the standard pseudomarginal scheme. So now for each proposed value of theta, I have to compute my control variates. And then I also update the random variates of a single block. And then I compute my estimate gamma hat at theta star and using my, um, my proposed random variates. And now I also need to save my random variates. And now in the acceptance ratio, because I'm using that soft lower bound, I plug in the absolute value of gamma hat. And now what this algorithm returns, so it's not going to return uh, thetas, which asymptotically are drawn from my posterior of interest uh, because, because of this, this absolute value here. But if we save the sign, of gamma, then we can compute asymptotically exact uh, posterior estimates. Okay, so um, I think I'm eating a bit into Carla's time, but uh, basically in the variationally sparse framework, we have the, the different parameters, our inducing variables, our likelihood parameters, our hyperparameters phi, and we're gonna use a metropolis within Gibbs scheme to iterate over each of these components. We're gonna use what is called whitening to um, avoid strong correlations between our inducing variables and our hyperparameters phi. So that is basically just a reparameterization of our inducing variables. And then finally, we have the inducing points. So good performance, as we saw in those, those, those simple, those simple uh, pictures, the simple figures, that good performance strongly depends both on the number of inducing points and the location of the inducing points. And there are various strategies that have been proposed in literature to select both the number and the location of the inducing points. And so what we do here is um, just to simply optimize the locations for a given number um, based on a cheap approximation. And then we will select the number of inducing points uh, based on the approximate marginal likelihood. So we'll increase the number of inducing points until the, an approximation to the marginal likelihood stabilizes or until we've reached our computational budget. Um, so Carla is going to take over now. Are there any questions at this stage? Um, I cannot see any question in the Q&A box, so Guys, if you have questions, it's a good time, as Sarah mentioned. No? Okay, so let me just um, stop sharing my screen and then. Okay, um, can you see my screen now? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. So, well, first, uh, thank you, Sara, and also thank you to the organizers. Um, I'm gonna start by introducing two-level non-stationary Gaussian processes, because these are the models that we are gonna use to demonstrate the pseudo-marginal scheme that Sara just explained uh, now. So to begin, uh, why two-level non-stationary GPs are important? Well, Many applications and uh, many models in machine learning and in uh, statistics uh, have been focused on using parametric stationary covariance functions. Uh, and that is uh, one base of its wide availability. There are several choices of the stationary covariance functions and also due to uh, its, uh, uh, they are computationally cheap. Uh, however, there are several applications where the stationary assumption is not realistic in practice. 
And that means that the process that we are interested in is actually going to be uh, spatial dependent. Uh, to address this, no, the two-level non-stationary GP framework um, is constructed by employing a family of non-stationary covariance functions that was introduced by Pashorek and Servish. And the general idea of these non-stationary covariance functions is to introduce the non-stationarity by permitting one of the parameters to vary uh, in the space. So here, this spatially varying parameter is denoted by sigma. And as we see, sigma depends on our input locations. Uh, this uh, parameter sigma is a d by d spatially varying covariance matrix and is usually referred as the kernel matrix parameter. And uh, basically, this parameter is going to control the range uh, and the direction of dependence of the process. So now, um, an interesting and an important aspect of this family of non-stationary covariance functions is that it includes non-stationary version of some well-known kernels, such as the um, score exponential covariance function and the matern family. To gain some intuition on these uh, non-stationary covariance functions here, um, I am showing a Gaussian process realization of um, mat, uh, using of a GP that uses a non-stationary matern kernel. To the right, I am showing the field of kernel matrices that produce this realization. And specifically here, I am assuming that the kernel matrix parameter sigma is an, a scale identity matrix, that it is constructed by using a single length scale process that is going to uh, vary in space, and that is going to depend on all the dimensions. In this case, it's going to depend on dimension x1 and dimension x2. So we see in this plot that we have, uh, at every location uh, where the process is observed, a cir circles of different diameters. And these um, uh, circles of different diameters are going to control the range of dependence of the process. So here, because we are assuming this uh, form of sigma, we are assuming that we have the same range of dependency both in both dimensions. Uh, but of course, uh, we can allow other uh, constructions of sigma. For example, if we assume a diagonal matrix of um, sigma to be a diagonal matrix, we can uh, permit to have different range of dependence in each of the dimensions. For this talk, uh, I'm going to focus on um, uh, this scale identity form for uh, sigma. And because uh, the parameter sigma needs to, be to, needs to be inferred at every location where the process is observed, a natural way to model it, it will be to use a Gaussian process prior, in this case, for the log transform length scale parameter that is going to form our kernel matrices. So here, in a Gaussian process regression setting, we will have, um, we will assume that we have a noisy, our noisy data that here is denoted by Y, um, uh, comes from a non-stationary Gaussian process, in this case, a zero mean non-stationary GP, we, whose spatially varying parameters that are denoted here by U, which U corresponds to this log length scale process, is also modeled with a Gaussian process, in this case, a stationary GP that has um, a length scale hyperparameter. So these kind of um, hierarchical structures are flexible, but doing inference is challenging. One, uh, because of the computational constraints of GP models uh, that arise from storing and inverting covariance matrices. And then uh, because of the high correlation between parameters and uh, the processes. These two issues are exacerbated in this model, of course, because we have now two nested GPs. 
Uh, and this is why this model is uh, an interesting model for the sparse variational framework that Sara introduced. Um, in addition here, I want to mention that these type of uh, models are connected to other uh, popular and flexible constructions that use uh, several layers of GP to make the model more flexible. Uh, for example, the deep GPs of Damiano and Lawrence, and here I put other references of models that um, also use a cascade of GPs. And basically all these models are different on how they combine uh, these layers of Gaussian processes. An advantage of the two-level GP model is uh, the interpretability. As we showed, the second level GP is introduced as one of the parameters in the non-stationary covariance function. And basically it's gonna tell us something about how the process is gonna look. Um, so here, um, now we are gonna apply the variation strategy for this two level model, focusing on a two level GP regression. So to do that, the first step is to derive the optimal sparse variational posterior that Sarah explained is uh, first we need to augment the model with inducing uh, points. And in this case, we are gonna collect the inducing variables for both processes, set and u. Uh, so we are gonna have inducing variables z tilde and u tilde. And the second point is to, well, the second step is to uh, minimize the KL divergence between the approximated and the true, um, and the true posterior distribution. That is gonna result on a lower dimensional uh, variational posterior that is shown here and that has this form. So we see and in this equation that we have again an exponentiated expected log likelihood term. In this case, the expectation is taken uh, with respect to both set and un. And specifically the elements of uh, this um, expected log likelihood term, we are gonna rewrite this um, as in here, just to highlight that the expectation with respect to set is analytically tractable for this model, but the expectation with respect to you are not analytically tractable. Um, specifically, evaluating um, L, which corresponds, sorry, uh, which corresponds to this expectation here, evaluating L for any given value of U is an M square operation. And of course, this needs to be computed for every single data point. So now to deal with these intractable expectations, we are gonna contrast um, here two approaches. The first approach is- Carla? Tell me, yeah. S sorry to interrupt. Uh, there's someone who raised his or her hand in the chat. So mm -hmm. let me remind you, if you want to ask anything, uh, you have to type your question in the Q&A box. And then I will read the question to the speakers but I'm not able to uh, to activate your microphone. So whoever raises or her hand, please type your question in the Q&A box. Sorry for the interruption, you can go on. No, no worries. Um, so as I was saying, to deal with the intractable expectations, uh, one approach uh, is to approximate such intractable expectation to uh, through Gauss or Mite quadrature. In this case, uh, the first level of inducing variable z tilde can be marginalized. And um, if we require to draw samples from z tilde, we can do that uh, directly from its conditional variational posterior, which is actually a Gaussian distribution. Then to break the correlation between uh, u and its hyperparameters, we are gonna apply whitening. And in that case, our target distribution is a whitened marginal variational posterior. Uh, the computational complexity of this approach um, is J and M squared per expected log likelihood evaluation, where J is the number of nodes used for the um, approximation of the intractable uh, expectations. 
N is our number of data points and M the number of inducing points that we are using. The second approach is the pseudo marginal scheme. In this case, we are not going to marginalize the tilde uh, to keep a factorized form of the log likelihood. Uh, but uh, we can still apply whitening and we are gonna apply whitening for both U tilde and Z tilde, again, to break the correlation. So in this case, our target distribution uh, is gonna be a whiten um, variational posterior shown here. Now, instead of approximating the expectations uh, with a quadrature, what we're gonna do is to look for an unbiased estimator of the intractable exponentiated expected log likelihood. And this is gonna be done by using the W stochastic block Poisson estimator that Sarah explained, where our control variates is again a first order Taylor expansion around the mean of U. The computational complexity of this approach uh, corresponds to kappa b m square plus n m square. The first term comes from the block Poisson estimator, uh, where kappa, as explained before, is the product, uh, is, the, is the average number of Poisson estimators that we are gonna use. B is our number of samples, uh, m uh, again, the number of inducing points. And the second term of this, um, computational complexity comes from computing our control variates here. And this uh, computation needs to be done for every data point. So we have uh, nm square. And now to uh, demonstrate these two approaches on a simulated example, um, I am here uh, using a toy example where I am uh, simulating 1,000 observations from the two-level GP model. And here I show uh, the non-stationary function with the noisy observations, which are the red uh, circles. And to the right, I show the spatially varying parameter that produce this non-stationary process. So we see that when the spatially varying length scale is small, we see a more wiggling behavior of the function, for example, in this area, as well as in this area. So now what we are gonna do is we are gonna compare the gauss my quadrature approach with the pseudo-marginal scheme. Uh, and for the gauss my quadrature, we are gonna use different number of nodes uh, to check what happens in terms of recovering the true parameters, the predictive performance, the computational time, and we are, go and we are gonna explore these as we increase the number of inducing points uh, used. So first here I show box plots of the MCMC samples of the logarithm of the noise variance for 30 inducing points, 45 inducing points, and 60 inducing points. Um, in each plot, I show the results of the gauss bite quadrature with four, five, eight, 10, and 15, no, 15 nodes for the approximation. In purple, the pseudo-marginal scheme, and in blue, the full MCMC procedure, so the non-sparse uh, model. And the first thing uh, in red, uh, the red line is the um, uh, true parameter value. So the first thing to highlight here is that the noise variance can be greatly overestimated, especially when we have few inducing points. So we see that as we increase the number of inducing points, we get closer to our true value. Still with 16 inducing points, our noise variance is overestimated. Um, and the second point uh, that I want to highlight here is that, um, Increasing the number of nodes used for the gauss mite quadrature approximation doesn't seem to um, improve the posterior estimates uh, of the model. We would have expected that as we increase the number of nodes, we get better posterior estimates. 
of course, this is only shown here for the noise, but this also happens for, for example, the length scale process. Uh, then to evaluate the predictive performance of the model, we, um, we do here uh, out of sample predictions at 300 locations. And what I'm showing here are the predictive estimates of the non-stationary function, again, for 30, 45, 16 inducing points. But now in each plot, I only keep uh, the results with uh, J equal four and J equal 15, as well as the pseudo marginal scheme. Um, of course, the first thing that we uh, observe is that when we don't have uh, enough inducing points or when they are not well located, important features of the function can be missed, especially in non-stationary settings, such as uh, if we look, for example, here, m equal 30, and we have a look to this area, we don't have in, in, enough inducing points here, so we are missing this wiggling behavior. This is better recovered when we increase the number of inducing points and we put more inducing points in this, uh, in this part. Uh, the same happens with 60. Now, um, the other thing to highlight in these plots is that for a given, for a fixed number of, um, for a fixed number allocation of the inducing points, for example, if we observe the plot um, B here, we see that increasing um, again J from, for example, four to 15, doesn't result in a better fit. Uh, we see, for example, that very clear in this region or also in this area where actually the function is uh, quite smooth. Um, something similar happened with the other orders uh, of the quadrature. Um, but this is going to be more clear in the next slide where actually we quantify the predictive performance in terms of the mean square error, the mean absolute error, and the empirical coverage. In addition, in this slide, I am adding the average computational time needed for 100 uh, iterations of the MCMC procedure. So here I show the results uh, of all the quadrature approximations, as well as the pseudo marginal and the full MCMC procedure. So um, as we said before, if we have a look to the mean square error, as we said before, uh, for a fixed number of inducing points, in some cases, increasing the order of the quadrature, uh, for example, if we observe J equal five, it actually results in worse estimates than, uh, for example, using J equal four, which is a um, green line that is just below this pink uh, value. The same happened and is more clear, for example, with M45. Uh, we have J equal 15, which has a worse outcome than any other uh, order of quadrature, which was smaller. Um, now, if we compare the results of our quadrature approximation with the pseudo marginal scheme, which is shown in um, uh, with a purple line, we see that there is a um, small reduction in point, wise, in point wise errors that is more clear in terms of the mean absolute value. So we see the purple line um, just going here. Um, here it is important to, to analyze these results um, also considering the average computational time. Because when we have a look to this plot, uh, we see that for 16 using points, the pseudo marginal scheme, the purple line, is even cheaper than uh, the Gausser mite quadrature uh, with only 30 using points and order four. So this is relevant um, because these computational gains that are, that are shown by the pseudo marginal scheme will permit us to increase the number of inducing points. Um, without uh, affecting the computational complexity and uh, because the in increasing the number of inducing points um, in this type of model is crucial to recover uh, non-stationarities. The last point uh, here uh, is uh, 
uh, are the results of the empirical coverage that uh, if we have a look uh, to this plot, we see in general an underestimation for all the experiments, which this can be in part uh, a result of the variational approximation. Um, and we see here that our pseudo-marginal scheme is uh, doing um, slightly better than the other, uh, uh, that the gauss might quadrature approach. Uh, one more thing that I forgot to say when I was having a look to the computational time plot is that obviously this plot makes clear uh, the computational advantages of the sparse variational framework. Uh, we see that uh, the blue line is a full MCMC procedure. And again, all the models are doing uh, better even when we increase the number of uh, quadrature, uh, uh, the, the number of nodes used for the quadrature. Um, with this plot, I conclude this uh, toy example. And just quickly to uh, finish the talk, I'm gonna make a summary of what we described. The first thing is the MCMC for variationally sparse Gaussian processes that was introduced by James Hensman is an attractive strategy due to its generality and computational benefits. However, uh, some models might require high order or multivariate Gaussian quadrature approximations, which one can undermine the computational gains. And the second thing here uh, is that um, thinking about this two example that I just presented, um, sometimes it's even difficult to uh, set the right order of the quadrature in more complicated models. So as an alternative, we propose a pseudo-marginal approach that is based on the W stochastic block Poisson estimator. And this pseudo-marginal scheme has uh, the advantage that it can be applied to any GP-based model where the expected log likelihood is not available in closed form, not only to the two-level GP model. And also that this scheme will offer computational um, gains that will permit us to increase the number of inducing points that we employed in the variational framework. And that is a key advantage for some, mo for some models, uh, such as um, models that look for non-stationarities. And finally, I highlight here that the advantages of the proposed to the marginal scheme will be more evident in bigger data set data sets as well as seen um, dimensions greater than one. So I stop here to thank you and to welcome any questions. Thank you, Carla, and thank you, Sarah, for the interesting talk. Uh, guys, if you have any questions, it's a good time to, to start typing your question. Uh, in the meantime, I wanted to ask you something. Um, the pseudo-marginal algorithms I've seen before, they, they, they use it for uh, estimating expectation uh, that works well, or sometimes I've seen pseudo-marginal algorithms where you have a large sum like you and you do some sampling. And then typically this is uh, a bit harder to use uh, because there's a lot of variance and that's why you need to use control variance, for instance. But in your case, you try to do both at the same time uh, does it make the method uh, harder to calibrate or on the contrary, because you have two, two free sources of randomness in the end, uh, it still works fine or? I'm not sure my question is very clear given Carla's face, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just, let me say in another way, when, when, I, when I've seen subsampling before, People were complaining that uh, this was introducing too much noise and then you were subsampling, but you had to sample a lot of terms to make it work. Or maybe use a control variance. And that you try to use that idea in the context of each term is an expectation. So each expectation also needs to be uh, replaced by uh, some uh, noisy uh, estimate. So does it make it even more complicated to use subsampling or? Um, can, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Ah, okay. So maybe I'll just make one 
comment and Carla can add on if she wants. So um, one thing that's that's interesting about that is that that, that is sort of what, what I expected as well. But um, when uh, when Carla implemented this, at least in, in the toy examples, um, we the, the optimal tuning parameters, so the value of kappa that is chosen, um, it's chosen to, so a large, a large value of kappa would be needed if we have a high variance. So in, in the tuning algorithm, we actually get um, very low, low variance estimates of our of our D hat, which gives us quite low values of kappa, at least in, in this simple setting. So um, yeah, I think we'd, we'd need to explore it more in, in other applications, but in this setting, it, uh, the variance of our estimator was, was actually not very high. Okay. And you think the, the, the gain in computation comes mostly from the subsampling then or? Because you can, you show in the end that your method was really faster than all, all the others. Mm -hmm. And I guess the quadrature methods is quite fast, except you have to compute all the terms, but you, yeah. So is it the subsampling that makes your method particularly fast, you think, or? Um, yeah, so for the control variant, so we only need to do, we, we don't need to evaluate that at all node locations. So only at the posterior mean. So ah, I see. Really, yeah. what what, and then we have the subsampling as well, which helps reduce it further. So I can see other question from the audience. Uh, first question is from Tom Loredo. Variational approximation can produce poorly calibrated inferences, for instance, with inaccurate credible region coverage. Have you checked calibration of variationally sparse GP credible region for toy or relay problems? Yeah, so that's what Carla showed. Um, Carla, yeah. do you want to go back to the plot with the empirical coverage? So yeah, that is um, a well-known problem with variational procedures is that, uh, so that plot figure C there is the, the empirical coverage. So that's the frequentist coverage of, of the, the method. And you can see that, you know, ideally we'd like to have something. So this is for the 95% credible intervals. So ideally, we'd like to have something around 95, uh, 0.95, but we're, we're underestimating here. Whereas with the full scheme, um, we, get, we get the coverage that we would expect. All right. And then we have another question from Alvaro. Uh, can the differences in MSC due, be due to a change in the number of quadrature points expected due to uncertainty in the estimation? Can the um, Well, yeah, I think... Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Um, I think actually the differences in the mean square error in terms of the quadrature orders comes from the fact of the type of functions that we are trying to approximate. So we make um, we, we try to look at the type of functions that we want to approximate with the Gauss Hermite quadrature, and basically these functions depend on both the location of the inducing points and the location of the observed data. That those functions change very quickly depending on the distance between the points, as well as on the value of the hyperparameter. So when we are iterating on the MCMC procedure, we are changing the lambda parameter, and that is going to change at every iteration all the type of functions that we are required to approximate. That's why it becomes very difficult to find, you know, in some regions of the function, one order can do really well to approximate those type of functions, but in other parts, it can do pretty bad. All right, thank you. Um, I see someone saying something in the chat. Let me check that. Okay, Tom is uh, saying thank you for your clear answer for the coverage. Um, anyone else? Do you have questions for our speakers today? Well, I guess you guys were very, very clear, <laughs> so, <laughs> which was true. I, mean, says, I think it was uh, super clear. And uh, you said the paper will be available on the archive soon, right? 
Yep. Right, yep. Carla? No, no question. No question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, uh, let's... David, go ahead. Quick one. Um, just uh, you've got the toy example there. Um, what sort of like real world problems would, would you be interested in, in applying like this? Obviously, it's a computational scheme for a model, but what, what's the use of the model? What are the applications of the model? So I guess it would probably be easiest to think of some kind of um, spatial example. So I think Carla's PhD work was initially motivated by some data on um, on crime levels uh, across London, is that correct? New York. Oh, New That's York. New York and London, yeah. Okay, so yeah, as you go across uh, spatial locations in New York, you can see quite sharp changes in, in the level of, of crime. I'm thinking a bit about the, the depth of the, like the second level of the, the GP, so, would that allow, say, two places that are physically dislocated to become correlated or something like this? And is that something you're going for with this model or does that make sense? Yeah, 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 no, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, what you are saying is part of the advantages of the model. So um, in, in part, uh, let me just go back to this uh, plot. So. In, in, in part, the flexibility from the model will come from the assumptions that you want to make of this type of uh, covariance function. As we said, you can put simply, uh, this is like a simple example where we, you assume that um, the correlation is the same in both directions and the diameter of the circle is going to dictate how um, one point or one location is affecting the others. Um, you can put something more flexible, which is, it will be a full covariance matrix, but then uh, you have the issue of having more parameters to be estimated. Yeah, okay. I, I'm just, a bit of me wonders if, as you go deeper, is it starting to become a covariance estimation problem? Is that a reasonable way to look at it um, or not? Mm. No, maybe not. Um, so with, by deeper, you have um, the references on different constructions of deep Yeah, uh, yep, yeah, yeah, here, here, in a second. Here, Dunlop. Yes. Um, so in, in that paper that I have uh, a bit more on, on deep GPs um, that are constructed through this, uh, through this formulation. Um, OK. Thank you. Well, I see no other questions, so maybe it's time to, to stop. Thanks again. Thanks a lot, Carla and Sarah, for your interesting talk. So I this customer, you know, I'm the only one clapping. <laughs> so, but thank you for everyone. David, you could clap too. Huh? OK, thanks a lot. I'll see you in a minute for the debriefing. Goodbye. Goodbye, everyone. Thanks for being, for attending. Thank you. Yes.